Good morning, church family. I want to invite you to join me as we all pray together and prepare our hearts for the Lord this morning. Would you join me as we pray? Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil or evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The song I'm going to sing to you today is from Mendelssohn's Elijah. This is such a wonderful uh, moment in the story of Elijah. It's where the prophets of Baal have been trying again and again loudly to uh, have their false god, Baal, light a simple uh, a pyre, and, and uh, Elijah waits and waits, and then finally, calmly, and yet confidently, calls upon the God of Israel, who then, of course, comes.
At this time, I invite our children to come forward for a special kids' message. Well, good morning. All right, so we're going to start things off a little different. We're going to start things off with a little joke. Do you like jokes? Okay. All right, let's see if you know how these work. Knock, knock. Boo. Don't cry. It's just a joke. So. <laughs> I love the knock, knock jokes. You know one of the things that they teach us? They teach us the certain kind of manners of, of how doors work and how... Uh, how we're invited into certain places, right? So we're going to talk, I'm going to talk with the grown-ups in a little bit about a passage. And this is something that Jesus says. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. If someone were to just come into your house, that wouldn't be very nice, would it? No. Probably illegal. Yes, that's very true. Absolutely. See, they have to be invited in, don't they? Yep. And that's how it is with God's house, too. But he, see, that's the wonderful thing. Is he invites us in. He invites us to come in. And now once people are in your house, right, once you've invited them in and they come in, you ever have your friends over to your house? Okay. Do they feel like strangers once they're inside? No. What do they feel like? Like friends, right? Like family. Absolutely. He comes over, not every day, but, but most of the time. Sometimes he does. Yeah. Yeah. And when he's there, right, he's part of the family, isn't he? Yeah. And that's the wonderful thing about when God invites us in. You see, we, we were brought in. We've been invited and we've been called in. Not to, to be strangers on the inside, but to be parts of his family. Pretty cool, right? Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer, and then I'm going to... Let you go with Miss Melinda. She's going to teach you all kinds of awesome things. Well, Miss Amanda's going to probably teach you, and Miss Melinda's going to help. Um, but just know that God has invited you into his house, not just to be a, a stranger, not just to be a guest, but to be part of his family. Amen. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for inviting us in, for calling us in. And Lord, we thank you for making us part of your family. Lord, we just uh, we pray that you would just remind us of that each and every day. That we would know it uh, when we wake up in the morning, when we know it, I know it when we go to bed at night, that we are part of your family. We thank you for that. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So one of the things I wanted to uh, do here this morning is you've probably noticed this wonderful stack of boxes here. Um, as you know, we've been collecting uh, shoe boxes for the Operation Christmas Child shoe box ministry for several weeks now. And you have brought in your shoe boxes. We've had some even uh, today coming in, and we'll probably still have a few over the next day or so. Um, at this point, I don't have an exact count. It's a little fuzzy at the moment, but I do know we're just over 100 boxes, which is surpassing our goal of 100 uh, that we set at the beginning of the year. So well done to you. Um, yeah, I mean, you can go ahead and that's, that's worth celebrating. Uh, and we just want to take a moment as, as part of our, our congregational prayer here this morning and just pray over these boxes as they go out. One of the things that's wonderful about this ministry is that you know, they go out to the ends of the earth. We have no idea. Uh, we can actually track them and follow them, but we don't know exactly where they're going to end up. We don't know which child is going to receive them, uh, but we do know that they make a difference. We saw many videos that uh, shared the testimonies of those that have received them in, in other countries. Um, it, it just seems like a shoebox here, but it means all the world to someone else somewhere in the world. And so we just want to pray that God's going to use even just a shoebox with some little trinkets inside and, and just some things to let people know that there are people out there that care about them. Uh, that he can take that, that he can use that, that he can use it to point back to him and uh, let people around the world know of him and his glory. And again, thank you for being a part of that. So would you join me as we pray over these boxes 
and over this body. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to be a part of your great work. We thank you for the work of Samaritan's Purse and the shoebox ministry that's been going on for many, many years. And Lord, we pray uh, for every child that is going to receive one of these boxes. Uh, Lord, we know that you are going to do a wonderful work through them. We know that miraculous things can be done through these boxes. And uh, Lord, we can't even imagine the eternal impact that is going to come through these. Lord, I pray uh, that you would just bless each and every person that packed one of these boxes with love. Uh, Lord, that you would just put it on our hearts to continue this ministry. Uh, that you would put it on our hearts to continue to be a part of the work that you were doing in this world. It's so easy for us to look outside of our front door, look outside of our windows, and think that the world is much smaller than it really is. But Lord, it's a great big world, and there's a lot of people in it. And there are a lot of people that are hurting. There are a lot of people that are struggling. There's a lot of people that need your hope. And Lord, help us to not be selfish with the hope that we have in you. Help us to spread it as far as we can to all those in this world. Lord, I lift up this church body. I pray that you would be with us, that you would heal bodies, that you would mend hearts. Lord, whatever it may be, whatever the need may be, Lord, you are the solution. You are the answer. You are the healer. You are the cure. Whatever it may be, Lord, we pray that you would meet our needs. And Lord, we pray for those that can't be with us here today. We pray for those that are outside in the community. Uh, we ask that you would make your presence known in their lives. And Lord, we pray that we would be a part of that process, that you would use us to reveal your glory to a world that does not know you, that you would use us to bring hope to the hopeless. And Lord, we pray with, uh, for those that are, are viewing online, either right now or at a later time. Uh, Lord, they have needs as well. And Lord, you know exactly what they are. And we pray. That you, being the God who is not constrained by time and space, would meet them where they are, wherever they are in the world. Bless them and make your presence known. And Lord, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to come together across the globe to worship you. And we ask all of these things, praying in that blessed way that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, church family, I want to invite you to go ahead and pull out your Bibles. Make your way back to the book of John. We're going to continue where we left off. We're in chapter 6. We're going to pick up at verse 41. So John chapter 6, beginning with verse 41, we're going to go all the way uh, to verse 59. We're going to finish out this section where Jesus is talking about being the bread of life. So once you've made your way there, I want to invite you to go ahead and please stand and join me as we honor the reading of the word. Again, this is John chapter 6, verse 41 through 59. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets. And they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds in my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, 
So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Would you join me as we pray, asking God to bless the reading, the hearing, the teaching, and the application of his word. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for every truth that you give us, even the difficult truths, Lord. We thank you for truth in a world that needs truth more than ever. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us now. May your Holy Spirit give us wisdom and insight, help us to understand you in a new way today, that we may give you new glory. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church family, you may be seated. So let's take a moment and kind of review how we got here, because we sort of started off in the middle of a, a thought, right? We began with this series of grumbling. So let's, let's back up a minute and kind of talk about what brought us to this point. Well, Jesus had, had just recently miraculously fed over 5,000 people, or at least 5,000 people, I should say. The disciples then decided that they had had their fill. They moved on to Capernaum by boat, and Jesus met them on the sea, walking on the water. We can't leave that part out. He walked out to where they were several miles, and then the people that he had just fed then saw in the morning that Jesus was gone and got into boats themselves and followed him to Capernaum. And then they find him teaching in the synagogue, and this is where Jesus is telling us here that he is the bread of life. And so our text begins, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Isn't that just the way we are as people? You see, we never grumble while we're getting fed. Doesn't typically happen, right? Maybe as kids, we didn't like what we were eating, right? But we more often than not do not grumble while we are being fed. We never question things when we're hungry. You see, we're happy to follow Jesus as long as that trail of breadcrumbs come. And then he says something that we don't understand. And we all of a sudden somehow forget how we got there. It happens just like that. We forget everything that led us to that point. We see this in verse 42. They said, is this not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? I noticed something in scripture. There is a limit to how far we will go with miraculous things. We can believe up to a certain point. You see, they flocked to him because they wanted to see him do these impossible signs and wonders. They had literally eaten the food that he created out of nothing. They were still digesting it at this point, most likely. And no one questioned a thing. At no point in time does the scripture tell us that as the food is being passed out, no one raised their hand and said, hey, is this safe to eat? <laughs> right? what's, what's in this stuff? Right? No one questioned any of this. They simply accepted it. Because despite the fact that they couldn't explain it, they also couldn't deny it. You see, there was bread in their hand. They could chew on it. It tasted good. It fed their bellies. It filled their bellies. They couldn't deny what was right there in front of them. And so they simply accepted it. There was bread where there was not bread before. In fact, they were even so committed to this. They were so I'll say bought into it, right? Because, again, they had eaten the bread. That they got into another man's boat. They pretty much, we don't know if there was an agreement that they had. But it was not their boat, right? If you remember, people had gotten there and they just like, there's a boat. Hold on. They may have stolen a man's boat. We don't know. I'd like to think they got permission. But it's another man's boat. They got into his boat and chased Jesus to Capernaum. This is how truly they believed in everything that they had seen and experienced. And then Jesus tries to explain all that he had just done. And that's apparently when he had gone too far. See, they had received the bread. They had eaten the bread. They knew everything to be true. And then Jesus says, hey, let me tell you how that happened. I was sent here from heaven. You can't be from heaven. We know your mom and dad. Clearly. 
There has to be some other explanation for how these miraculous things happened. See, following Jesus is easy until he gives us hard truths. When they're easy truths, when they're truths that we agree with, they're easy to accept, they're easy to understand. But church, there are certainly some hard truths in the Bible. Some things are hard to understand, and some things are hard to accept. But something being hard doesn't somehow make it less true. I think all of us can understand that in our times going through school, there were probably things that were hard to learn. There were things that may have been hard to understand, but we don't get to simply say, I'm not going to learn it because that's difficult. We don't get to say that that's not true because I can't comprehend how it can be. Sometimes we have to recognize that it just simply is. You see, we are limited in our capacity to understand the things of God. We can only go so far with it. There is an end to our ability to comprehend. But that doesn't limit God's glory. Our limited capacity does not constrain God in any way, shape, or form. And it doesn't limit our obedience, or at least it shouldn't. I think it does at times. I think there are times when the scripture is very clear about something. And we say, well, I don't understand why that could be. So that's not going to apply to me just yet. I'm going to need God to explain this to me. I'm going to need him to rationalize this to me. So that I will then be obedient to what he has commanded. I want to encourage you, church, that if you don't understand the truths that are in front of you at times. Remember all the truths that brought you. To that point. Because God has a way of giving us these little truths along the way. Giving us bread along the way. Again, those easy things to receive. Those easy things to digest. And then he gives us something more difficult. And sometimes we just have to trust in those moments. Our text continues on. Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. You know, we were just talking about hard truths. This was a hard truth. In particular, to this group of people that he is speaking to, this was a hard truth. Jesus was speaking something that was contrary to what they believed. You heard me teaching the kids a minute ago that Jesus is the one who lets us in the door. Right? We don't, we don't get to show up and kick the door in. We don't get to come in and just open up and walk in. Jesus lets us in the door. And this was controversial to the Jews at this time because they believed that salvation could be earned they thought that they simply kept the law, that they were owed eternal life, that they were owed some just reward for what they had done. But Jesus tells us that salvation is from God alone. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, we spoke a few weeks ago about salvation being from Christ alone, went through our soulless. And I just want to point something out here so that there's not any confusion in that. See, Jesus teaches us that the Father draws us in here in this passage, but he also teaches us where we are drawn to, and we are drawn to Jesus. He says, no one can come to me. No one can come to me. Jesus is our source of salvation. It is the Father that draws us in, but Christ is the source of our salvation. We are drawn to him goes on to say it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. He's reminding them of what was written before. See, Jesus is pointing to his divinity here. Again, he's trying to explain to them how all of these miraculous things came to be, how these signs and wonders came to be because he is God. The prophets had told them that they would be taught by God, and yet when the one teaching them reveals himself to be God, they are now all of a sudden surprised. You mean the thing that you said you would do, you have done? 
I can't believe it. We get surprised when Jesus does exactly what he says he's going to do, don't we? I think part of it's because that's not very common these days. We're so used to people not doing what they say they're going to do that when we have someone who always does what he says he's going to do, we can't comprehend that. But everything that Christ has promised us, he has been faithful to fulfill. See, we've reached a saturation point, I think, in the information age. See, in this time, the time of our text, there was a hunger for knowledge. There was a a thirst for knowledge because there were so few sources of it. When you finally got some truth, when you finally got some knowledge, you clung to it. But now... We have access to so much information that the hard part is discerning what is true. See, we're always taught, especially in papers and things, if we're going through and doing schoolwork, we're always taught to cite our sources. It's a little frustrating sometimes because you think some of them don't really need a citation. You can be like, well, the sky is blue. I'm like, well, what's your source on that? Okay, right? We're always told to cite our sources. We always have to go back to the origin of the thought. Whatever it is that we're conveying, we go back to the origin of the thought. I want to ask you, do we apply that to what we know about God? Do we go back to the source in what we know about God and what we receive in our knowledge about God? Everything that we know about God must come first from God. Not from authors, even good ones. Not from preachers, myself included. We always have to go back to the source. Not from anything of man, but from God. More specifically, from God's word. See, you can learn biblical truths from all kinds of places. Right? I'm not saying that people can't help you to understand what is in the scripture. You can learn biblical truth from all kinds of places. But we must always return to the origin of the thought. Check your sources. Do the scriptures support whatever is being said by this writer or this speaker, whomever it may be? Does scripture support what is being said? It's important for us to remember that the words of man cannot add to God's word and they cannot take away from it. And so we have to accept the hard truths just like the easy truths because They're true. We can't skip over difficult parts of Scripture. We can't ignore difficult parts of Scripture because they're just as true as the easy ones. He continues, verse 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true blood, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him as the living Father sent me. And I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. It's amazing how back and forth we are sometimes with what we hear and how we hear it. Jesus says that he is from heaven after seeing him do these miraculous, undeniable things. And the immediate assumption is that clearly he must be talking about something else. Clearly there must be some other explanation. He can't be meaning what he is saying. And at the same time, we come to this section where Jesus says that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood. And we find ourselves saying, there is clearly no other way to understand this other than literal cannibalism, despite the fact that he's been using bread as an illustration this entire time. That's immediately where they jumped. 
was he is talking about literal cannibalism. There are times when we sort of pick and choose when we want to take God literally. What I've come to find is it's almost as if we just simply want to find something to disagree with. Whichever interpretation seems more controversial to us, we're going to lean in that way so that we can find something to disagree with for some reason. Now, it probably does not surprise you to hear that these statements caused all kinds of controversy over the ages. Christians were thought to be barbarians by early Roman civilizations and many others. They say they eat flesh. We're given all kinds of ridicule. But let me just say that he's not literally suggesting that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood. There's no place in scripture where we actually see this happening. He's not endorsing cannibalism here. We do, however, see Jesus make statements indicating that things are representative of his body and blood. I want to direct you to the book of Luke chapter 22, one of the accounts of the Last Supper. You can go ahead and turn there if you'd like. Luke chapter 22 verse 19 specifically is what I'm going to look at. Now, typically when we do our communion time, I read from the words of Paul that he's Simply referencing this as well. So, again, going back to the source of the original thought. Let's go back to the Last Supper. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you. Or that is poured out for you, rather, is the new covenant in my blood. See, he makes these illustrations time and time and time again. You know, there's an old maxim that says you are what you eat. That's a sobering thought for many of us, myself included. See, we understand that what we physically consume dictates our state, right? If we eat right, we will feel good. We'll be healthy, we'll be energetic, and we'll grow in strength. All of these things come from a good diet. But if we eat poorly, well, we feel bad, don't we? Maybe not in the moment, but certainly later. We'll be lethargic. We'll be weak. We are the byproduct of all that we have put into ourselves. But again, Jesus is not talking about an eating of physical flesh and blood. There was physical bread to eat, but he uses that to make this bridge. So we're not talking about physical things here. We're talking about spiritual things. And Jesus is the only source of spiritual nourishment. He says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. There's not another option here. He's not saying you can snack on something else and then come back to the Son of Man. He's not saying that you can get by. He's saying that unless you are feeding your soul with Jesus, there is no life in you. There is no other source of spiritual nourishment. There is no salvation apart from Jesus and there is no sustenance apart from Jesus. We can't receive the gift of salvation from him and then just simply hop in our boats and go off on our own. You see, we need Jesus every day of our lives. We need to know him. We know him from his word. He has told us everything that we should know. He has taught us about himself. We need to know him in prayer. It's one of our opportunities to know him on a personal level. See, the scriptures help us to know who he is, help us to know about his character. But if we're not careful, the scriptures alone sort of give us an academic understanding. But Jesus invites us to know him personally. We can speak to him. And he speaks back to us through his word. We can have that relationship with him. So we need to know him not only in his word but we need to know him in prayer, and we need to know him by trusting and obeying him. You see, this is how we handle hard truths at times. Book of Psalms, 
Psalm 34, verse 8, says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see. Time and time and time again, there's this illustration being used of what we taste, of what we consume, of what we put in ourselves. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience him for yourself and see that he is good. And we can't do that without trusting him. We can't do that without following him. When we encounter a difficult truth in the scripture or are faced with difficult truths in life, we're given an opportunity. Every trial that we face is an opportunity to learn more about God, not just in an academic sense, but in an experiential sense. We have an opportunity to learn more about God by following what we do not understand and allowing him to reveal himself and reveal his truth in the process of it all. You see, when we look at the order of things, we see that Jesus fed the crowd before telling them that he was the bread of life. Before trying to reveal this difficult truth of trying to unpack this mystery, he just says, here, let me give you something to eat. Let me give you the benefit now and the explanation afterward. And they were glad to receive it, just like we are. You see, we've been given the benefit now. We've been given salvation up front. And the explanation he gives after. The explanation we pursue after. We desire to grow in our relationship with Christ after having received the fullness of the benefit. He has fed his people first. And now he is teaching us how it came to be. And so I want to encourage you that if you find yourself in your walk, if you find yourself in your study, if you find yourself in your prayer life, whatever it may be, if you find yourself stuck on a piece of scripture that's just too hard to swallow, don't spit it out. Just keep on chewing. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you even for the, the difficult truths that we can't fathom. And Lord, we thank you for being patient with us. We see, we see that you've given us the fullness of your mercy and your grace without any explanation or understanding on our part. You just simply said, I know you're hungry. Here's bread to eat. I know that your soul is starving. Here is my spirit to sustain you. And we, in our starvation, were glad to receive it. Lord, I pray that we would not be quick to walk away from the moments when you teach us what we need to know about that. The moments when you teach us more about who you are. The more moments when you teach us more about how we can follow you, how we can serve you, how we can point back to you in all things as you have created us to do. Lord, help us to remain hungry, not because we're starving, but because we want more. We want more of what you, what you bring. We want more of you in our lives. We want to know you. Lord, give us a passion for your word. Speak to us clearly in prayer. And Lord, help us to trust in you when you take us through those difficult moments in life. Help us to learn every step on the way and help us to remember your faithfulness, your steadfast love and faithfulness when we do face those trials. To not despair, to not become despondent, to not dismay, but to instead trust and know that just as you have proven yourself trustworthy in days past, you will do so again. And the things that we may not understand today, we will understand tomorrow because you will reveal them to us in the midst of our trials. We thank you for continuing to teach us through the entirety of our lives. Help us to be good students. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.